morning, everybody. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. We're really excited to be working with, with UTSA um, and in this capacity. So uh, as Phoebe mentioned, I work with Elastic um, as a part of community, but really specifically with students in higher education. Um, so I am the arm of community that helps to provide product access, training, support, uh, and events like this, uh, workshops and lectures uh, to help students learn about what Elastic is, learn how to use it um, for different, um, our various solutions, um, and really just kind of support you with whatever you might need, whether it's research support or technical support or anything like that. So, um, you know, this program is rather new and, and you know, Elastic is really excited about it. And very, very committed to education. Some of the things that we offer are listed here. I, I won't go through all of them. Um, you know, I think that um, it kind of speaks for itself, um, but really, you know, the campus is open in terms of um, how, you know, you need Elastic to support you. Um, so I will plug into the chat. Um, the link, you know, one of the things that we have is a link to our 30 day cloud trial. So it's specific to students and educators. So you do need to use your EDU email address, but this really, you know, is the kind of the gateway to all of our solutions, whether it's machine learning um, or, you know, enterprise search or anything that you really want to use um, in, in the Elastic Cloud. So you are feel free to, you know, start that trial to kind of play around. And if it's something that you want to continue with or you're using for a specific project, that's really where I come in in terms of giving you that extended access and, and learning how that we can support you moving forward. Um, we also have a lot of free trainings um, and different things that, that we can do to kind of help develop your skill set along the way. Um, so I, once again, will put the link to our site in the chat as well as uh, my email and the link to the cloud. And I just encourage you to just explore a little bit. Um, if you're familiar with Elastic, great. Um, take it to that next level. If you haven't ever used it and don't know what it is, hopefully this will shed some light on it today and, um, and then we'll help you moving forward. So once again, super excited to be here. Um, I'm gonna turn it back to Phoebe who's going to talk about just really engaging with our broader community before we move to Emmanuel for the presentation. So thanks. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. So um, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, all three of us are on a team at Elastic called the community team. And kind of our role uh, with Elastic is to help spread awareness and educate. So uh, that's why we're here today is to share about how utilizing Elastic for data science can make your life easier and fun. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to mention really briefly about the Elastic community. So we have about 150 user groups across the globe. User groups are groups of people who are interested in Elastic using it um, and they meet on a regular basis. Uh, you can typically find our user groups through meetup.com and uh, the Elastic website. And so I would highly encourage y'all to go check out our user groups if you're interested in learning more. Uh, you can click these uh, QR codes here. I'll also drop these links in the chat. Um, but you can join our, uh, our virtual user group. Uh, so we do regular meetups and we have events uh, at least two times a week or more. And then um, we also have an Elastic Community Slack workspace. So this has channels on every single topic under the sun related to Elastic. So every solution, every tool. So particularly for um, the data science world, there is a machine learning channel that I would recommend you check out. So you can join that here. And then we also have a community YouTube channel where we record many of our meetups and you can view them, learn. Many of them are hands-on workshops that will guide you through uh, getting started on a particular uh, path with Elastic. So I would definitely check out the YouTube channel. And then um, we would love to highlight how you are using Elastic um, on our Elastic blog. And so if you end up using your cloud trial to utilize Elastic in a project and you'd like to share that story with the world, we would love to highlight you. So please contact me. I'll also drop my email in the chat and uh, we can uh, start a conversation about getting you um, promoted on our website as far as your, your project utilizing Elastic is. Okay, so that's pretty much for me. I'm going to hand it over to Emmanuel now, and uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And over to you, Emmanuel. Awesome. Thank you, Phoebe. So welcome, everybody. Let's have a look at what you can do with the Elastic stack from a kind of more data science angle. I'll go ahead and... 
Hopefully you're able to see a Jupyter notebook on the screen. Excellent. Okay, right. Ah, oh, it's lovely when your slides program crashes. You need two seconds. Ah, excellent. Okay, All right. Let's dive in. So today we'll chat a little bit about how to use Elasticsearch and Kibana, and I'll explain what those projects are. My name is Emmanuel. That's my Twitter handle on there. I'm a community engineer at the company, which means that I look at the ways that in which people uh, use the Elastic Stack and uh, quite a bounty of free products, and I try to come up with more useful ways for them to use our products and to spread the word. So that the core of the stack um, are these open source projects. Um, to the right, we have Beats and Logstash, which are to do with web application monitoring. And you might have friends who be using that kind of thing uh, in any kind of web developer programs or computer science programs. Today, we won't talk about that. Today, we'll focus on the two on the left. So at the heart um, of the Elastic stack is Elasticsearch. It's a distributed search and analytics engine, which is to say that you can throw numbers at it or text, and it will um, get you results for your queries very, very quickly. Um, it's a NoSQL data store. That's another way, if, if you've heard those terms, another way of describing it. And Kibana is like the graphical user interface uh, for it. You can absolutely um, talk to Elasticsearch just from a Jupyter notebook. Uh, it has a open, like, well-documented JSON API. But as a data scientist, you might want to explore a bit. And that's where Kibana comes in uh, without having to take your data out of it. So, um, a little bit about the concept behind it and how it works. It's very different to say MySQL or PostgreSQL or um, the Oracle database um, or, or Microsoft server, um, Microsoft SQL servers type stuff. So here, Elasticsearch will break your data up that you put into it into pieces that we call shards um, rather appropriately. And then it will put those pieces into separate baskets, which we call nodes. And a node can be, if you're running on something like Docker, it can just be a like virtual process, or it can be um, one virtual machine, or it could be even one physical computer. Uh, but anyway, that's a node holds a number of pieces of data. And the interesting thing about Elasticsearch is that it scales horizontally, which I'm sure you have heard of many other data stores as well. Um, but here, you don't have to set up any kind of complicated replication process in order to expand your capacity and your ability to hold more data. You can simply add more nodes. And uh, there is a lot of work, including actually um, academic work and implementation of various theories of distributed systems that have gone into and in the last decade into making this really easy. But this is a particular strength of Elasticsearch. And uh, indeed, as, uh, I believe partly that's why it was named Elasticsearch to begin with, because it was always a goal uh, to be able to easily add things like CPU and RAM to the compute pool. Um, so, and like the thing with this is that obviously if you have a Jupyter notebook, that's a bit difficult to scale. It would work on your laptop. And so from there you have some choices as a data scientist. And of course, like for proper production, you might go with Spark and Hadoop, uh, like to, to be able to store the data and then do distributed computation. But that um, step isn't always particularly easy. And if you have your data in Elasticsearch, you can do a number of steps in your project without having to go um, all the way to Spark. Okay, so where might you actually encounter Elasticsearch? Um, so I'll be honest, it's probably not going to be the very first tool that you should learn as a data scientist, but it's easy to use, it's free, because everything I'll show you, you'll be also able to download if you want to play with yourselves. And 
it's also ubiquitous in other areas. And as a data scientist, you'll be dealing a lot with other areas um, of a company or a client of yours. So Elasticsearch is already widely used in search. So we have a number of large um, retailers, like e-commerce retailers in the UK, a kind of like Target or Walmart, which I don't know whether they use it in the US, but here in the United Kingdom, our equivalents definitely use it, like John Lewis, Marks and Spencers. They, they power the front-facing product search on their websites. Um, it's used a lot for analytics and interactive dashboarding. So, you know, you want to build something up for top brass to look at, you can do that. And then uh, it keeps the data up to date as well, easily refreshed. Then a huge area for us is web application monitoring. So you could put um, text logs from all of your web apps, metrics like CPU, RAM, disk, network, and code traces, which is sort of like an X-ray into an app, tells you exactly which function is being called and how long it's taking, and what else it's calling. Um, so this is great for people on the DevOps side. And that's kind of how we came, you know, uh, how we came into really our strength as a company. After we started on the open source project, we had to find a way to feed ourselves and web app monitoring was pretty much the first a uh, huge use case maybe together with search. So then we have, we'll talk a little bit more later about uh, our machine learning module. And that's part of our commercial offering, but it could definitely be interesting for you as data scientists. And we have it, or it's also, the stack is also used a lot uh, nowadays in security. So we have um, a security information event management system, a SIEM on offer. Uh, which is for people who do perimeter defense type stuff. And we also have workstation protection. So basically anti-malware, kind of like how you would install an antivirus, but for servers um, or actually for you know, end user computers. So like your student computers um, in your labs, for those of you who still go to campus. Uh, so, okay, so this is where you could encounter this and this is where the kinds of data that you might um, need to analyze, uh, especially if you're your colleagues or your future colleagues in data platform engineering who usually work with data scientists, they will often make the choice to put stuff in Elasticsearch, especially if it's a time series kind of thing, or if it's a number of events like a hotel website who even looked at the listing. And so you have tons and tons of data points in the millions, probably in the billions even. Uh, that's a quite a common use case. All right, so, and then you, know, you get asked to analyze it. So the point of this talk today is your data is in there, um, what do you do? So we're going to talk about how to put something in Elasticsearch, how to get something out of Elasticsearch at the end. And then in between, we're going to explore and see like what tools does Elasticsearch actually give you to uh, explore. So without having to pull it out to Jupyter, use matplotlib and Folium and other Python libraries, or pull it out to R. So what can you do while the data is still sitting in Elasticsearch? Uh, okay, so that's what I call the exploration phase of a data science project. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the visualization. Um, so I should say here, it doesn't, like Elasticsearch can do uh, quite a few aggregation functions. So once you group data by a certain factor, um, it will be able to, um, it will allow you to do some analysis. It can't do things like, um, detecting influencers except the machine learning module and it can't do things like a, a NOVA or a chi-square test uh, or even statistical regression. So it's not for that. Uh, but you'll see what you can use it for. Okay, so let's get started with the demo. So we're going to be analyzing Airbnb data for Melbourne city in Australia. Um, this is something that our machine learning team had prepared. So I'm not going to have a lot of time to go over every single line in the notebook and it's not really the focus. We'll actually spend much more time in Kibana looking at what you can do with the data. Um, for 
those of, I mean, I'm assuming you are familiar with the pandas library, but in case not, it's a um, data processing library in Python, very popular among data scientists. So what we're doing here is we're reading in a CSV of um, listings, of Airbnb listings. Well, <laughs> so that's a good sign. Let's have a quick look. So I'll uh, share my terminal with you so you can see what's going on. Okay, I think I am running Jupyter uh, by accident in the directory above. So what we'll do, we'll just copy the necessary data. I mean, I could just restart it, but you know, since we've already started the demo. Aha, excellent. Okay, we can ignore the data type warning. It's just complaining about a column. So CSV is loaded up and we'll see in a second uh, what that looks like. And these are the kind of things that we have in there, a street, city, state, zip code, property type, and we will uh, have plenty of time to spend. But this is what the data actually looks like. And indeed, as you can see, this is what we'll mostly focus on is a neighborhood, uh, countries always Australia, neighborhood property type, number of bedrooms, and price today. Oh, and maybe a bit on number of reviews. But this is the, the overall shape of the data. So here we do a little bit of, let's make sure everything is a number. I replace any not a number uh, with a one, or assuming at least that many uh, bathrooms and bedrooms, and also convert the price field to a float rather forcefully. Okay, and this is just a sanity check. Yeah, so we have the expected number of listings and number of hosts. Um, so here we'll do a little bit, this is just to show you, um, yeah, you could do your normal filtering in pandas, and that's indeed what we're doing here, but as you'll see, you can also filter in uh, Kibana and Elasticsearch. So we're going to just focus on whole apartment listings because the data quality there is a lot higher. And this is something that you should still be doing in uh, Jupyter, just to underscore that. So this is canonicalization. Um, we know what the state is. It's Victoria because we're only focusing on Melbourne listings. So these are all of the unique values, uh, including some in kanji. So we don't care about any of that. We are going to replace the entire column with uh, the string Victoria. And yep, another sanity check, which is what I expect to see. That's how many neighborhoods and streets and so on. Okay, so we're going to output this data to a file so that um, you can see what it looks like. And Really slow today. There we go. And so this is what the final um, result looks like. There's no headings in this, but because it'd be easier for us to input into Elasticsearch. And this is something that's actually important for you to see. Um, but you can just remove the heading, of course, manually while processing the data uh, later. But what we're going to do is we're going to take each row here and make it into a JSON object that we're going to throw straight into Elasticsearch. So here we have a host ID and I think a listing ID. And then we have streets, neighborhood, city, state, country, zip code, so on and so forth. Property type, bathrooms, bedrooms. All right, so that's what the final data looks like just to, you know, to help you visualize it. So here comes the Elasticsearch specific part. Um, Elasticsearch doesn't have it doesn't require a schema, but it's much better if you do put one in. Um, so most of these, for most of these, it's not so important. And it will automatically, if you put in one document, it will just assume then if a number of reviews was an integer, it'll be an integer for every following document. Uh, so it will guess the schema. But um, for things like location, it's better to 
uh, specify it explicitly. So I suggest that you think about what fields you have and that you do something like what I'm doing here. You explicitly specify the schema. And you can, of course, get access to the notebook. It's a link. There's a link on the slides, and we'll drop a link where you can find the GitHub repo with all this stuff at the end. OK, so, so this, you can see here why it's important to have location like this, because we are actually, instead of having one latitude and one longitude number, um, we are going to get those. If I didn't have a schema, those would be guessed as just like a number. Whereas if I put them together in an object like this, under the label location, underneath as a lat and a lon, and I say in the schema here that it's a geo point, then that enables Elasticsearch to treat it as geographical data and plot it on a map, which we'll be doing uh, later on. So. Okay, so that's our that's our schema. Uh, this is just a generator to read the data that we output back in and uh, hand, it, hand it over to Elasticsearch. All right, so we're going to be using Elastic Cloud, and I'll show you what you would need to do in order to um, get to this point yourselves. So first off, you go to um, that cloud uh, trial um, link. After you sign up, you'll be greeted with a login screen. So you put in your email and password, or you log in with Google, if that's what you decided to do. And then on here, you will click Create Deployment. And as I said, has a lot of use cases for the stack. So you don't care about the other things for now. You just want the Elastic stack, so top left. Uh, hardware profile also, you just want IO optimized. Later on, once you get to play with more data, you can decide on what you want. Select your preferred cloud provider. Um, I like Google Cloud best. And select the zone nearest to you, which is for me, London. Um, version you can leave. Yeah, that's it. And then you name it. And uh, then a little bit about the trial, actually. Um, if you're just playing with it, I would set to the fault tolerance to one zone. So you don't get data redundancy, but like uh, it, the chances that uh, the cloud instance will crash and lose your data, especially permanently, are, are extremely, extremely, extremely low. And so, yeah, it most likely absolutely nothing will happen and, and it's a significantly reduced price. If you wanted to play with machine learning, which I'll just touch on later very quickly, you can, you would have to enable it here from the customize button and you still get it free, at least on the small scale. So as you can see here, hourly rate is free. So for the duration of the trial, you can use it even though it's usually a commercial feature that you would have to pay for. And Kibana, which is the graphical UI you will need. And here, APM, unless you want to do code tracing and web app monitoring, uh, you disable it. And then you hit Create Deployment. And then that's it. We're away. Uh, so I've already done that, so you don't have to you know, do that. And when you create a deployment, ah, it has also decided to log me out. And um, when you create the deployment, it will give you a username and a password only once. Um, so that, that'll be it. You need to uh, get your password then. I mean, it's not um, terrible if you forget them or you forget to do this. You just hit here, reset your deployment password under here, and you'll be fine. And it'll give you a new one. All right, so the what do you do you need? If you're using Jupyter, you need the Elasticsearch endpoint. And just hit Copy Endpoint, which I've already done, and I've popped into um, an environment file so that here I can read it like this in Python os.environ. And yeah, so that's it for now. That's that's how we get to this point. That's how I get this link basically, and that's how I get this password. And I also recommend it's good practice to put them in an environment file that's ignored by uh, Git or whatever version control you're using so that you don't show them just like now, this will work even though you won't be able to see my credentials. Okay, so th there is something here to, that can delete and index, um, which is just to reset the demo if I need to, but 
obviously there is nothing to delete, so there's no point in running it. Instead, we want to create an index with the schema or mappings um, that I specified. Not zero problem. Ah, okay. Now it looks like I have already run that. So indeed, do we need to run the delete first? Right, and, and then we run the create. Um, and that's fine. And that works. Okay, so what's an index? An index is like a table. If you're familiar with SQL databases, relational databases, the concept of table there in terms of data organization is an index here. And it, uh, they don't break down any further like rows or columns. You just have documents in an index and Elasticsearch. Okay, so we have created the index and we have used the schema, or as we call it, mappings. And then what we need to do is pop all of those records that are currently in pandas memory in to Elasticsearch. Um, I'm using a helpers uh, bulk function from the Elasticsearch Python client. And what it takes is a uh, Elasticsearch client, so with the settings of how to connect, and a generator or a list with all of the data. And it will batch it up in groups of, I think, 500. It will create like 500 lines of JSON and then send it onto Elasticsearch. And um, just so you can see the import. So this is how you use it. That's what you need. And that's for connecting and that's for the Um. Is it me or is someone else having struggles with the connectivity? Yeah, I think oh, Emmanuel, you're just, breaking yeah. up. Uh, yeah, I think you're breaking up a little bit on us. So if you could just Sorry. repeat what you just said. Hey, oh, can you hear me now? Yes. I can. Your face is frozen, but we can hear you. <laughs> Okay, hopefully that'll unfreeze shortly. Right, there we go. Okay, yeah, well, so this, there we go. <laughs> yet again, yeah. So uh, I've, uh, I'm trailing out having two connections for this exact reason. So I just switched from fiber to 5G. I'm in one of the experimental regions where we have it. So let's hope this is better. Okay. All right, let me know, like feel free to unmute and just like, let me know if you're not hearing me, because there's little point in me clicking around if you can't see me. Uh, okay, so we've uploaded the data into Elasticsearch. So let's go and see what that looks like. And um, initially, where were we? Oh yeah, we were here. Right, so from the deployment that you've created, you want this button, this big blue button, open Kibana, and that's the graphical UI. You click it, you're right here. All right, so. This will say things like, try our sample data. I'm not gonna do that today, but I would recommend that you do this. It's quite interesting. Um, there is e-commerce data, there is also flights data, and there's some pre-generated um, dashboards, including a map of like where flights are going. Uh, so it can, of course you can see exactly how this is built when you click on edit on any of those visualizations. So it's super good. Um, so I recommend doing that. For today, we're gonna click Explore on my own and we're gonna open the Discover. Ah, okay. And we see nothing. So we have uploaded about 15,000 records, but we don't see anything, right? So why is that? The reason for that is because we put in a schema on the Elasticsearch side of things and now the documents are in Elasticsearch. But for the graphical user interface, we also need to create an index pattern this basically explains what a specific index or a group of indices that are have the same fields, like what are the fields in those indices, what types are they, and so on. And I'll show you how this is useful. It, it seems like an extra step, but it's um, actually very useful. Uh, is this... 
<clears throat> uploaded the data to the right environment. Let's have a look. He's complaining of not having any data. Ah, okay, it has not. Looks like when I, I accidentally stopped this, looks like when I restarted it, for the talk, that's decided to be a pain. All right, so we're gonna check my environment file. Yeah, so these are the correct ones here. And this is how I ran it, so nothing super special. Set the environment variables and run Jupyter. And we're gonna open that. Basically, the data has gone to my like preparatory index where I rehearsed for the talk and rather than the correct one. Okay, so we're not gonna do so I'm gonna uh, talk you through these again. I'm just gonna run through them. In Jupyter, you can also just say run to cell, but I prefer to see what's up. I prefer to see errors as they occur. Okay, so this is the correct one. All right. And we don't need to delete here. We just need to create. That should have been my queue. All right, okay. So on we go, uploading the data. Luckily, it doesn't take very long. And I guess, that actually, there will be documents already, so we can do this. All right, there we go. So now I clicked on check for data, and we see that there is an index Airbnb Melbourne, and we're going to create an index pattern for it. And here you can do things like use a star in case you have many indices or like many tables, if you still think of it like that, they have the same fields. Um, okay, uh, there is nothing else here that you need to do. You just hit create, makes the pattern. And as you can see, now it knows what the fields inside are and whether they're searchable, whether you can run aggregation functions on them. All right, so what was the point of that? Why have the extra step of, I have a schema and then I also have an index pattern. If you had a timestamp field, which we don't hear, it would show um, right in the middle, right here, it would show a histogram of, the, of where your data is, of when it lands um, in the timeline. But also for this, it's for filtering and for auto completion. Let's say I forgot the heading of the field property type um, I just say type and here it comes up even though I'm searching you know, halfway through the field name. And then if I do this, it will even autocomplete the top 10 and um, like the top 10 most popular values in that field. So in order for Kibana, which is superb, right? I mean, here you go. I want to look at houses and uh, among Airbnb Melbourne listings, like just click. I didn't have to remember to type property type equals house, the capitalization or any of that stuff. I could just do it in here. So that's what you create an index pattern for. So it's just one step. Um, right, anyhow. Okay, now uh, we've got some data. So I don't know about you, but for me, this is pretty hard to read. Um, yeah, it's sort of, it's highlighted the field names, but yeah. other than that, can we get a more usual tabular structure out of this? Um, of course we can. All right, so we'll take out the property type, we'll take out the price and the neighborhood. What is it, what can we do? Um, oh yeah, number of bathrooms, number of bedrooms. Let's do that as well. And if I remove my filter so that we get different properties, yeah, as you can see, this is displaying very cleanly and that's much easier to read. So I used the column toggle, which is like this third icon next to any field. And you can basically build your own um, yeah, customizable ones. So you can also sort. So here are the most expensive properties in Melbourne. So this is great for just exploring records wise, um, but you can do this with any other data store. So what can we do that's more interesting? So let's go to visualizations. Um, right. 
Uh, let's uh, kind of pretend that you work for the data analytics consultancy branch of Wayne Enterprises. Um, so what does Batman want you to do? Wayne Enterprises has been hired by a local small firm managing Airbnb short-term rentals. Uh, in this case, not in Gotham, but in Melbourne, they're going global. And um, we've gotten the data in, but now let's try to visualize it. Uh, so we don't know anything about a data, which is very common uh, for any data science project to begin with. Okay, so the most appropriate visualization would be, I went a bit too quickly over that, um, would be lens here. And there are a number of other visualizations and we'll check out area and a map, which is an actual geographical map. Uh, but you also have horizontal, vertical bars. You have a line for trends. You have a pie chart, which, which I know data scientists usually uh, laugh at. And, and you have a number of the things that you would be used to in general, but lens is uh, a bit different. Okay, so with lens, what you can do is you can just throw fields in and it will suggest appropriate visualizations for you. So drop the neighborhood and it's just showing me uh, the Y axis automatically becomes the count of records. So, okay, and there's 5,000 within Melbourne neighborhood and then Port Phillip neighborhood, 2000 and so on and so forth. And it suggests different ways of looking at that. But where it gets more interesting is you can add more stuff. So for example, by dropping price. Now, the average of price, um, it has automatically suggested an average, has become the y-axis and neighborhood has become the x-axis. So now we see the most expensive, five most expensive neighborhoods. And I mean, that's all right for exploring, but if I drop in property type, then it, well, it goes even further. Okay, so what are we looking at here? And um, if you actually click on this breakdown here, uh, you'll be able to understand it more easily. It says number of values three, and then here it says grouping top values for each neighborhood. So what this does is it fetches the five top neighborhoods, and then it fetches the top three property types within each of them. So uh, in the B side, houses are the most expensive, then townhouses, then apartments, because they are also ordered here order by the average of price, or you can do alphabetical. Um, and then likewise, I mean, Yara ranges, uh, well, yeah, villas are popular, and then castles apparently are the next most popular. Uh, it must be an interesting neighborhood to live in. Okay, so this is what's happening here, and that's the uh, breakdown. Oh, it's really dark all of a sudden. That's UK afternoons for you. What can you, what else you can do here though, is you can uh, change the pivoting really easily. So now I've, instead of going by first neighborhood and then property type, I change it so that property type is, um, is first. So now it has selected the top three property types within all listings, all 15,000. Like, okay, three, three houses are the um, most expensive. All right, so then within three houses, give me the top five neighborhoods that have three houses, but there's only two. It's only Melbourne and Whitehorse. And in Melbourne, they're very expensive and in Whitehorse, not so much. That's Melbourne refers to Melbourne, Melbourne center, by the way. All right, then um, here we have, then the next most expensive type by average price is a boutique hotel. Uh, so that's, but it's only in one neighborhood in the Yarra Ranges. And the next most expensive is a farm stay, but that one, um, does have five or more neighborhoods. So this is why we get this weird display. Like some property types are just not present in enough neighborhoods. But um, anyway, the important thing here is for you to see, you can just drop in fields and explore quickly and easily, and you can change around the pivoting and you can change um, this. So you get different aggregation. So now this is the maximum of the price rather than the average. And you can also go with, uh, bar charts and uh, with horizontal vertical bar charts and pie charts and what have you. So this is kind of a, uh, a suggestion. Uh, this is the, the hinting type visualization. And uh, if we set this back to 
average, we could save our visualization to use later. We'll call it lens this. And we are going to go to on to the next type. So we're going to look at an area because that's um, also quite common on display. So for an area, uh, we're going to look at so here we, we can't just drag and drop. We kind of have to know what we want, which is the difference, I guess. Um, so, uh, right. So we don't want the count here. We want average of the price. That automatically gives you only the numerical fields when you select average. And that's the use of that index pattern I was creating at the very beginning. All right, so then for X axis, Let's do let's do a histogram. Let's try to see if there is a, a relationship between the price and the number of reviews. So you'll see what I, if you haven't used a histogram, you'll see what it is in a second. Um, and also you'll see what the interval is. Okay, so what is this? So we wanted an area, so we went with a histogram, which means from the minimum value to the maximum value. You will notice I didn't have to specify the bounds. So I didn't have to say, you know, go from zero reviews to 630 reviews. I was just like, just give me a histogram. And Elasticsearch will find the bounds for you. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a huge correlation between number of reviews and price. Uh, what if we tried the number of bedrooms? Now here, um, the interval is simply this the like how fine grained you want it. And because I know that there's hundreds of reviews, I selected a 10, um, but like for bedrooms, I'm gonna go with one because I don't expect there to be properties with hundreds of bedrooms. And indeed it looks like the maximum is actually 11. Okay. There is definitely a relationship between price and uh, number of bedrooms, but it seems like it's almost a diminishing return. It, it, this is 15,000 uh, know, points of information that are being aggregated. So past seven bedrooms, the price seems to drop off. It could be because um, they're in more expensive neighborhoods, as in the space is more expensive in more expensive neighborhoods, so you don't have uh, just that much space for an uh, eight or a nine bedroom house. But I'm guessing 10 and 11 are simply, there's very few of those. So they're going to be outliers. Um, okay, so we can do a little bit of a further breakdown. We can uh, split the series by neighborhood just to like check out that, that theory. And what do we need to select here? So a histogram is what you're seeing here from uh, kind of a, a numerical thing from zero to the top value. A date histogram would be from the past to, could be a future date or, or the present. And, but what we want is terms. So this is where you get into a specific string and we want the unique values for a neighborhood. Okay, and uh, this is a complete mess. Uh, it's very pretty, but completely useless. So what's happened here? Um, what's happened is that we're currently viewing for each number of unique number of bedrooms, so like one, two, three, we're viewing the top neighborhoods by um, average price. So that's like for one bedroom, what are the top five neighborhoods? For two bedrooms, what are the top five neighborhoods? So this is pretty useless. What we need to do is reorder them. So there you go, I just drag that up and hit update. Okay, so now we're going by neighborhood first and then by number of bedrooms within each neighborhood. And indeed, all right, so on average, a six bed is, is more expensive in Hume than a six bed in Monash. Great, all right, sure. Um, so from then on, like we can go and look at other factors uh, or join it with another data set. Speaking of joining it in our data set, let's save this. We call it area viz. I mean, so far, like I've shown you how to use this 
tool, like how to use Kibana, but you, okay, yeah, you can do this relatively easily in Matplotlib. And, and what I'm about to show you, you can do with Folium as well. I mean, all of this is doable in Jupyter. And the thing is, you don't have to get it out of Jupyter. Like this stuff is just available for you. You can go and play with it, especially if your data is already there because your um, data platform engineer colleagues put it there. Yeah, you, you don't have to busy yourself with unnecessary work. You just go in and use our tooling. So we're going to join some data sets and we're going to do it uh, with a, a GeoPoints data set. So first off, let's overlay our listings because remember we had a location and I'm going to actually uh, not do, we can do clustering. So if you select show clusters and the results exceed the number, this is just for performance on the map. And so you don't get overwhelmed. You will get the usual clustering thing and you can color them differently and all that. But uh, we are going to do, we are going to limit it to 10,000 because I actually do want the lots of little dots. Um, right, we are going to call this listings. And for a two tip on each listing, we're going to do Let's see, bathrooms, bedrooms, uh, neighborhood, and price. Yeah, okay, oh, uh, th these will do. All right, so now when I hover over one of those properties, it'll show up like this. Okay, great, so customizable map. Now, what else can we do here? Well, at the moment, they're all the same color. What we can do is color them differently dependent on the value. Oh, and we can also change the icon so that it's not this dull marker, but it's a building. And uh, let's make that a little bit bigger. That's too big. Yes, that's a bit more reasonable. All right, so the fill color I said by value. Okay. Let's do price and let's pick the most, the most garish possible scheme. Okay, All right. so this is a little bit easier to uh, peruse at least, I make them a bit smaller. Okay, All right. so yes, a, a red one is going to be more expensive. Now at this point, um, you can do filtering as well, which is worth mentioning. So let's say I just want to look at expensive stuff. All right, perfect. And I want uh, more than six bedrooms, so seven or more. Okay, so actually this is not so expensive at all anymore uh, because you know if you hired us out with, uh, with with lots of friends, then exit. So you're looking for a party house. You, you should probably not be looking right now, but maybe you're in anticipation of the pandemic ending. Okay, so I'm gonna remove the filters because I promised you um, to do a join, like to, to join two different data sets together. So I am going to do that. Let's close this. And we are going to get in some GeoJSON. Uh, the selector is never where you want it to be. Talks, data science, GeoJSON. Okie doke. So those are the um, neighborhoods in Melbourne. And, and this will also create an index called neighborhoods. So you'll be able to see the um, the borders a bit more clearly in a second. So this, this is your typical GeoJSON with like polygons defined, you know, super, super um, narrowly, super accurately. Uh, get rid of that while we're waiting.
I can't. It doesn't usually take that long. I'm sorry it's taking too long. I have this prepared for you so you can see it, but I'd rather show you how I create it. Mm, be a network connection issue. Say if I say cancel, okay. I mean, it usually only takes a few seconds, so uh, let's do that again. Uh, yeah. Oh, neighborhoods already exists. Yeah, okay. Of course it does. Okay, so um, I'll show you how to delete an index. So inside Elasticsearch here, when you open the side menu, there is this Dev Tools thing at the very bottom. And that gives you an amazing console that allows you to do lots of things. And uh, Elasticsearch is just, uh, it's just an HTTP JSON API. So in this case, I will simply issue a delete request uh, to like the local endpoint slash neighborhoods. That's the equivalent of that. If you click here, copy as curl, that would be what it would look like. Um, or I guess uh, in curl notation, it would be curl, it'd be like this. And you know, it would be wherever, wherever it's running, you know, uh, HTTPS, Elastic Cloud, uh, your endpoint, your port, slash neighborhoods. That's all this is doing. Anyway, it says acknowledged, true, uh, which is good. Add layer. Okay, so import. And we can also do something else. We can actually see. Uh, so I, I want to get neighborhoods. Oh, it hasn't finished indexing yet, so I want to complete. But I want to get the count of documents just to see what's going on. Okay, so there's 17 docs. Aha, okay. That's better. All right, so um, how do we do a join between these two data sets in here? Uh, so first off, let's configure this particular data set. So at the moment, there is no tooltip. Um, there isn't really anything that interesting, but at least a neighborhood. Um, yes, there we go should be visible and then we want to join and we want to do a term join we want as literally like sql database neighborhoods dot neighborhood we want to be joined to airbnb melbourne that says the listings dot neighborhood again okay and then we can specify um, something okay so here we have a count so this is how many listings there are now, if we change the fill of the neighborhoods by the count of listings, yeah, we can pick this garish color scheme again. Okay, so this is how many listings there are. So there's 73 here, and there's loads of them here, 521. No, no, no that's in this, that 1145, actually. I got that added to the tooltip automatically. Okay, so number of listings, interesting, but maybe not that interesting. Now, what you could do is other things, like, for example, the average of the price. And you need to reselect which field you want the joint to work on. Now, there is not huge differences, 170, 142, 180, so I mean, it's interesting to see. Now we know this just from looking at it pretty quickly. Um, but what we can do instead is the sum of the price. So this now becomes also a function of how many listings there are, which you saw a, a little bit earlier. So showing you the number of listings and the average of the price. And now we're doing the sum of the price. And okay, these are like basically the most profitable neighborhoods. Uh, and you get the most properties and also the well, it's a function of both the price and how many you have. 
Yeah, but anyway, this is a fair bit clearer. All right, so now you can also filter this if I say uh, neighborhood keyword and I go with Virginia. I don't Emmanuel, I just wanted yes. to mention that there were a couple of questions in the chat and uh, we will have a Q&A um, yeah. once you're finished presenting, um, but I just wanted to call that out that uh, I think we go right to the hour. All right. Oh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, there have been a couple of issues, but uh, you're right. All right. So you've seen how to uh, visualize in different ways. So you can save that as a map list. Basically from here on what you can do is put them all together in a dashboard and you can add them and plop them in pretty easily. And so if you did have to do like any interactive uh, dashboarding like for your company's bosses or anything of the sort and this is fairly useful and again, for neighborhood, it, you can um, basically you can filter across an um, entire dashboards, which is something that I wanted to make sure you saw. Okay, there you go. So the, all the visualizations have reworked themselves uh, to the global filter. Uh, this is pretty useful. And it also has, like, you can make it uh, update itself automatically. And you can, of course, save those and review them later and so on. Um, right, so let's have a look at the questions in chat. That is a fair point. Uh, if people need to drop off, I could continue showing you some other stuff, but uh, let's have a look what we have from the top. Herb is asking, we're working with an application that pipes data from an edge device to Elasticsearch. Our custom software in C++, oh, interesting question, uh, currently records our monitoring data to CSV files on a local CPU. We use FileB and Logstash to push the CSV file data to Elasticsearch in almost real time. Alternatively, we have the option to add code to our C++ program to push the data directly to Elasticsearch. Right, okay, yeah, so yeah, that's a very common thing in monitoring, uh, whether to send or whether to um, buffer the data somewhere. You could send it directly, but um, be aware that you know, what if your program is experiencing difficulties and you, or what if the network is experiencing difficulties, you don't wanna lose data and so, Actually, like for logging, my preferred approach is uh, structured logs. Uh, so if it, r rather than outputting you know, text, output it as JSON that you can store directly in Elasticsearch. So then you get rid of Logstash, um, but you keep using FileBeat to send it on because it will take care of, okay, if the network is down, I know up until what uh, file marker, file position, I was at, and I'll continue from there. Um, so for me, that's still the best approach because otherwise you could do it in your program, but you're gonna add then a bunch of code to deal with what if the network's down, uh, which you know we've already written in FileBeat, so I don't really see the point of doing that work again. Um, yeah, but if you're using Logstash, like, um, if you can restructure whatever's coming out of it, not to be text lines, but to be directly, you know, the end JSON that Logstash is currently outputting, if you output that, definitely better. Uh, if you look for structured logging, there are actually libraries that can help you with that kind of thing. I don't know about C++, but in Python there's struct log, and in Java there's libraries for this, in Ruby there's libraries for structured logs. So yeah, definitely better. Uh, then the next one, 
What are the set of tools available in the Elastic Stack for structuring unstructured data? For example, a user wants to collect system logs or network data from multiple systems. Oh, right, okay. So this is exactly a bit that I said uh, to everybody that we, like, I wasn't gonna uh, like dive into. Uh, but this is sort of our bread and butter. In addition to Elasticsearch and the Kibana interface, I've been showing you today. Um, if you use, um, especially for system logs, you can use FileBeat. So that has the ability to parse logs as well, especially if they're standard system logs like syslog, um, you know, MySQL logs, Nginx access logs, Apache logs, like that kind of thing. Uh, look into FileBeat and to most probably be able to do what you want. If not, then Logstash will definitely be able to do what you want because with Logstash, uh, it's an extremely powerful like regex engine, basically. You can define whatever you want. And FileBeat, you can also configure like, very, very closely for parsing logs. Uh, then network data, it depends on what kind of network data you mean here, but we actually have a thing called packet beat. Um, you can also unmute, by the way, you don't have to, uh, to type your questions out, you can just talk. Uh, Zeke, I haven't actually seen, I think I've heard that mentioned. I, I wouldn't, I, I don't know in this case, to be honest. Um, could you Okay, but at what level? I haven't used those tools. So, at what level are those? Uh, like, what are we looking at? Just TCP traffic, or yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, it's it pretty much helps us a set of like log files into text. And there's something that we encounter a lot of times. Like uh, a lot of us in, in the in the uh, research, we store a lot of like uh, sometimes some structured data into text files. Sometimes it is uh, semi-structured. Sometimes it's totally structured. So. It seems that FileBeat and um, and uh, some other of, other of these beats have plugins that we can automatically use and load mm -hmm. into Elasticsearch to structure some types of data. But some others, let's say that you have a CSV file, then I think that you can use Logstash and some other plugins. If I'm if I'm not wrong. Um, if you if you just have a CSV file, yeah, you can use Logstash and you can set it to uh, parse uh, from that. I think with a CSV file, you should be also okay with FileBeat simply. If it's just ingest this file, please, yes, you can do that with FileBeat. Um, there might be modules that deal with this better. Like I'm not aware of whether there's a FileBeat uh, Zeek module. There is. Yes, there is. Yes. Um, so that that's what I would. Yeah. In that case, that's what I would use. And. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So yeah. So packet beat would be recording like traffic and where your data is coming and, and going to. But it's uh, yeah, it's definitely different to Zeek, and I'm sure Zeek is very fully featured. So you will want to be using Zeek, and then ingesting it with file beat. Uh, all right, yeah, cheers for the link. Oh, and thanks, Phoebe. So Phoebe's posted a uh, link to a blog post, uh, which I didn't know it posted about, uh, about collecting and analyzing Zeek data. So have a look at that for the full configuration. Yeah, that so, one's a great one if you, Typically, Zeek and Elastic go together in the security sort of realm, but um, but you can glean some insight from that and see how you could potentially apply it to whatever you're working on. All right. So um, since we are uh, shortly past the hour, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about other things that might be of interest to you. And uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. Mm, so for um, machine learning, we have uh, unsupervised and supervised detection, actually. And so this is what the unsupervised model looks like. You feed it a bunch of data, and, and it goes off. And, oh, that's my mouse, right. 
And it goes off and it tries to detect what are the normal bounds and then it gives an abnormality score or an anomaly score to anything that's outside of those bounds. And uh, there is no like um, exact number of data points that you need to give it, but I find that about two weeks of data is great if you have monitoring challenges. Mm, this is a commercial module, but uh, if you're on, if you use the, the trial link that was placed in the chat for 30 days on Elastic Cloud, uh, you can use this free. Uh, play with it, see if it fits your needs. And actually on Elastic Cloud, it's uh, pretty cheap to have access to this kind of functionality. Previously, this was only available to you know, like customers that could pay a license per node, uh, which included, you know, like high level support and was uh, more expensive. So uh, on cloud, it gives you great access. And then something else that might be of interest is we do have a Hadoop connector and it makes integration with Spark and Spark streaming easier. And it does have support for Spark SQL, but just to say like the, the usual, mm, uh, use case for this kind of thing would be you do your main analytics and your main data crunching uh, in Hadoop and you store your raw data in HDFS. And then in Elasticsearch, you just store the results of the analysis and you view them with Kibana. So if you are at the point where you're using like Spark, Hadoop, and HDFS, that's how I recommend seeing it. So you probably don't, uh, you could keep raw data in Elasticsearch, but like Hadoop and HGFS will, you know, will go more easily together and um, you'll be able to get in a, a lot more data at a lower cost if you're really like at that level where it's you know billions of data points. Um, if it's less than, I'd probably just consider uh, Elasticsearch and uh, Spark. Um, so yeah, you can check that out if you need it. Um, Phoebe already mentioned about our community. I highly recommend that you check it out. We have pretty regular meetups in uh, Europe um, and America in the States as well as Latin America. So you got lots of content to choose from. It's more relevant to you. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel. And for everything that you need to get the slides, I'll, I'll pop a link in the chat. For everything we talked about, like we Hadoop connector, machine learning module, community, and of course a notebook and everything that I used, you can uh, take them from here. Have any questions? There is one more Ready question in the chat. Excellent, let's see. Can we serve custom deep learning models? No, you cannot. Uh, I'm afraid um, we do have uh, a lot more advanced stuff than normally detection. So we have things like um, inferring language and we have, we definitely have binary classification and as of more recently, we have multi-feature classification. Um, but you can't just translate your Python, like you can't just, it's not a platform to run your PyTorch model on. So this is why I was saying in the very beginning and like why I underscored, this is not a replacement for Jupyter and it is not then a replacement for Hadoop. Uh, for HGFS and Spark and Hadoop. It's just a, like, if you're, it's an additional data store, you can do a fair bit with it, like group data, aggregate data. You can explore and use it in the exploratory stage to get to know your data, such as with the lens visualization or with that tabular display I showed you. Uh, you can do some transformations and changes to the data, but yeah, it's, it's not a platform to like, just run your models on. Um, okay, so just to show you, because I did promise you in the beginning, uh, we ran over unfortunately a little bit, uh, just to show you, like, okay, how can you manipulate data? If from the site menu, if you go to the very bottom to stack management, there is a transforms thing, which you should probably know about uh, if you're interested in data science. So rollups and transforms, in this case, I'll just touch on transforms, are uh, something that enables you to kind of, um, it's like materialized views or a pivot table in Excel. It allows you to um, take something and then like get um, the result of that aggregation. I'll show you what I mean. 
So basically here, let's say that your client, you know, Wayne Enterprises told you to go and get them uh, all records pertaining to St. Kilda City. And you know, they wanted to analyze like what property types are good to invest in. And so here you can do terms, property type, and then for aggregation, uh, well, we can do, let's go to the price, the average of the price. And so here you go, that's what you'll see there. Oh, and we need to hit enter for it to actually filter down. Yes, there you go, so city is now only St. Kilda. And these are the property types. So in St. Kilda, it's best to invest in a house that you would have to make they can then go ahead and compare that with the original purchase price. You would need to join that data set in there. Um, but what you can do is uh, create an index and continuous mode is something that will cause this transform to run continuously. This is if you have a date uh, stamp on your documents. So any extra documents that come in the raw data get added to the analyzed like this you know, grouped data, the pivoted data, uh, which is very handy. So if I do that, then we'll get our transform here. And this is the data, preview data in it. Now, very quickly to show you in the Jupyter Notebook to retrieve data, and there's just a bit of best practice stuff. So. Up here, I used helpers.bulk to upload records, and I said use a list or a generator, right? Okay, so here, uh, if you want to retrieve all your data, because it's, yeah, it's common, and if you wanted to do like PyTorch, like Aaron is asking, you will need to take your data out. Uh, so you will want in the Elasticsearch PY Python client, you want to use helpers.scan. You're doing a scan search. And so here I've told it, get me up to a thousand records because I know there's only five in there uh, from the Celt Kilda Index, from the Saint Kilda Index. And then we'll, we do a bit of first thing just to take, um, like basically get price and then average, get this kind of nested field into a flat field. Uh, you can do your own kinds of processing. And then this is the magic bit from dict. So once you've got a flat dictionary, um, you're away, basically. You can just use data frame from dict. And there we go. That's the, uh, the result. So that's the resulting data frame. So that's just to show you how to also take data out um, because, you know, kind of really the important things to remember, helpers.bulk from the Elasticsearch-py client and helpers.scan. That's why you need. That's it. And in between, you can play with the data in the ways I showed you. Or do we, that's, the, that's everything I wanted to show you. So do we have any more questions on any other? While parsing large SQL queries, oh, let me chat up here. Um, in Elasticsearch, it throws a parsing exception most of the time. Okay. Uh, well, you need to prevent it. Are they valid? queries in another data store. Like, so like a lot, the Elasticsearch SQL plugin does not support everything. Um, so it's not like using MySQL. I, I can't tell you, yeah, it depends on the exception you're getting really. There is no general way to prevent parsing exceptions except modifying the query so that uh, to, to one that's supported by the plugin. I would say, however, this is exactly where what you do on discus.elastic.co. That's what uh, that website is for. Right. Um, post your question on here. And where would you need to post it? I think for SQL, yeah, you just use the Elasticsearch form. So go to the Elasticsearch section of the forum and post your actual query. Uh, post some sample data as well. Like what are you ingesting in there? And then the query that's giving you the exception and the version of the stack you're using. You do that. Um, 
Yeah, they rarely go unanswered, as you can see. There's many, many, many where my colleagues and I are answering questions all the time. So, and that link is actually up further in the chat. So if you just scroll back up through the chat, yeah. the the link to the forum is there. So, are there any other questions for time series? You mentioned, is it possible to get an Arima or Sarima model directly from? Uh, elastic. So my honest answer to that is I don't know, but uh, let me have a look at Rima. Ah, right. Uh, moving average. Um, no, I don't think you can. Hmm. You can get you can get a moving average aggregation, but yeah. I think for, for this, we post on Discuss. Uh, if you're really needing to do this, if you post this also on Discuss, we'll be able to uh, have a look for you. Um, let me have a look at the moving average aggregation to see if you could do this. But that's, I know that you don't only need a moving average, like you're looking for something more specific than that. No, you can only do a moving average inside a histogram or date histogram aggregation. You can't do um, the regressive analysis, not directly in an aggregation here, I'm afraid, no. This is something that you would need to still do in Jupyter. Yeah, but if you have other moving average needs, um, okay, yeah, I would use this aggregation. But I haven't used it myself, so to be honest. All right, any other questions? You can also unmute. Okay, actually, yeah, let, let's call it, because yeah, we're quite a bit over time, but uh, thank you, it's quite a good discussion. <laughs> questions from various angles, which I didn't expect. Um, I thought it'd be mostly kind of purely data science and introductory questions. So thank you for yeah for participating and for your time and stay safe and stay hey. healthy. Thank you, Emmanuel. Have a good day. Hopefully, you guys, will have the recording shared at a later time. We'll send that out to everyone as soon as we get confirmation to do so. And if you have any questions. All of the content is here. You can either email any one of the speakers or you could email me as well. This is Lori um, in the event that you have questions and need to stay connected. Thanks again to all. Have a good day. Stay safe.